From London, the National Broadcasting Company presents War Telescope, a review of the war week and a forecast of possible developments to come. War Telescope features Elmer Peterson of NBC London staff, a veteran reporter of the European scene. For his regular Saturday report, we take you now to London. This is Elmer Peterson in London. There was a time here in Britain when people had only the one aim of turning this country into a fortress. A time when the question of how long the war would end was far more important than the question of how long it would last. But this is 1944, not 1940. Now, this country is both a fortress and an arsenal. It is more than capable of defending itself. It also has become the assembly field for soldiers, munitions, and equipment to be used in time in one of the greatest offensive operations the world has ever known. Instead of those days of waiting for the enemy to attack, we have days now of waiting for new attacks against the enemy. And as the winter days go by, the tension here is tightening, partly in anticipation of the day when the great attack begins and partly because the British people expect further punishment of war before the war is finished. And since they expect that, their desire is to get it over with. Once the invasion of Western Europe is underway, once the great and final battle has been started, the people here in Britain will find some relief from this strain of waiting for things to happen. But at the moment, this strain is very much with them, encouraged by events such as those of last night, when the Germans tried a fire raid on London. It was not a successful raid. It was a spectacular raid, with flares and searchlights and sprays of rocket shells going up, with the enemy dropping a considerable number of incendiary bombs, with a sky festooned with ribbons of light, with your ears deafened at times by the continuous reverberating thunder of London's great anti-aircraft gun. What fires were started were brought under control quickly. In one way, it was just another raid, and the people here have known many of them. But more and more, the reaction to these German raids develops the question, is this the beginning of the final German reprisal? Is this the beginning of the attacks on this country with which the Germans hope to block the invasion of Western Europe? It's a healthy attitude, this. It reflects the basically realistic attitude which the British people still retain toward the war, when all is said and done. We have had our periods of over-optimism here in Britain, our periods of believing that victory was just around the corner. We have had our predictions that the end was not far off. But few, if any, Britons have ever thought that final victory would be achieved without further further penalty upon this country. Britain has become a fortress, it's true. But living in a fortress does not mean that you are immune from attack. And this is something the British people are fully aware of. They were aware of it last night as the fire services battled the fires that were started. They were aware of it as for minutes on end the sky above was pockmarked with bursting shrapnel and it's quiet broken by the whine of airplane engines. But this much is clear. Whatever attacks the Germans do manage to make against this country in the future, the defenses of this country are ready and waiting. No matter what the Germans can put forth out of ingenuity and resourcefulness, and desperation for that matter, there will be effective countermeasures here in Britain. Among other things, it's announced that at least three enemy aircraft were brought down last night over their own bases on the continent. They were brought down by RAF planes which were over the continent for the specific purpose of knocking down those planes. It was further evidence of how British defenses against air raids include more than guns, but also some highly efficient night intruder squadrons. It's an unusual task in many ways that these night intruder squadrons have, and today I'd like to introduce you to a young American who has a share in this. He's unusual himself, this young American, in that he's one of the few American airmen doing this sort of work. He's Lieutenant James Luma of Helena, Montana, a member of the 8th Air Force, but attached to a Canadian squadron, a squadron of these night intruders. His plane is the Mosquito. His particular battleground is the pitch darkness of the sky above German airfields on the continent. His specific task is to shoot down German bombers and night fighters as they returning to their own airfield after raids on this country. Lieutenant Luma is 21 years old. He's fairly tall with curly black hair and deep-set brown eyes. He joined up with the Canadian Air Forces when he was 18. Today, at 21, we present him to you as a veteran airman, a young gentleman of the 8th Air Force, who rides through the night on missions as difficult and hazardous as any, although that's something he won't admit freely. Before we let Lieutenant Luma do the talking, I'd like to give you a better picture of what he sees and does when he's in action. He goes into action, remember, when there's a raid on this country. 
When the news comes through that German planes are on their way over, at his airfield, Lieutenant Luma gets his orders to scramble. In a matter of minutes, he's boiling his way across the English Channel. As he leaves, British anti-aircraft guns and searchlights may be in action. He goes away from the fighting over here to get set for his own particular brand of fighting. Namely, to get Jerry at home base when Jerry comes racing back to airfields on the continent. And, Lieutenant Luma, as I understand it, you managed to get at Jerry now and then on these night intruder operations. Uh, yes. Our squadron has knocked quite a few down. Well, you've got two to your credit, I understand. Uh, yes. We got them both over enemy territory. My navigator and myself, that is. Well, to me, Lieutenant, this job of flying at night in a plane as powerful and fast as a mosquito must provide some strange sensations. Uh, yeah, it does. It's a highly concentrated sort of work. That is, there's... Lots to do in flying and trying to find enemy planes in the dark. The sky is an awfully big place to go looking around at night. It's easy enough at times to find the airfields where the German planes are going to land. They usually light it up. Jerry planes try to sneak in, of course, with their lights off. And occasionally a German pilot will think he's safe and turn his lights off. That makes it fairly easy. Well, how can you tell, Lieutenant, when you have hit one of these German planes? Oh, you can tell easily enough. It's like watching a bit of dark shadow explode. Flames up, and then you see the flame going down. Well, it's like sort of watching someone throw a big torch out of a high window. Afterwards, you can see the flames scattered about on the ground below you, just as though someone had kicked a campfire around. Well, what impression do you get, Lieutenant, of a raid on this country, as you see it from the air? It doesn't seem very real, for the most part. And when we go out, we can look up into the night and see ak ak shells exploding around enemy planes. Make little yellow puffs of color. On the ground, there's a patchwork of little bits of flame. Sort of reminds you of a Fourth of July celebration back home. We don't get more than a quick look at anything like that. It's when we happen to find ourselves going over a blacked-out German airfield or a German ak ak ship that we get our share. Because we're flying fairly low, as a rule, we draw light flak. A lot of it is tracer bullets, which cut all sorts of fascinating patterns. Mostly red, but some green and yellow and white. All of which can cause you trouble, I take it. Yes, unfortunately. If it's behind you, you don't worry much. If it's coming up in front of you, it's bad. If it's coming up in front of you and going down behind you, it's really bad. But on the whole, I think your job is fairly safe. Mm -hmm. That's what you say. In that connection, Lieutenant, and speaking of these very mild adventures of yours... What would you consider your closest experience in this night intruder work? I think the time we went in at the wrong place on one of our first trips and got over an airfield and plenty of flak. In our efforts to get out, I smashed our compass. <laughs> and in getting back to home, we ran over another airfield and got some more of the same. We were really glad to get home that time. I don't blame you. Well, now, you must work fairly fast in getting off the ground when you start off on these night intruder operations. Yeah, we have to figure a course out and get off our own airfield in a very short time. Well, it's a very effective work you're doing, Lieutenant. It does have its psychological effect on the Luftwaffe. Isn't that true? <clears throat> yes, that is true. One reason the Jerry pilots are in a hurry to get back to their own fields is that they want to get to those fields before we do. Well, that's a brief picture of what Lieutenant James Luma of Helena, Montana, is doing over here. Good luck to you, Lieutenant, and to the other members of your Canadian squadron. There's no question, after all, but we can expect more raids on this country, and we know you'll be doing your part against them. One explanation, of course, of a raid such as we had last night here in Britain is that there is the German desire for propaganda material for their own people. In their determined effort to prolong the war, the Nazis must do everything they can to hold the confidence of the German people. And in this respect, it's obvious that the Allied air offensive against Germany is worrying the Nazis more than the crushing defeats of the German armies in Russia. The best evidence of this so far has been the exaggerated German accounts of recent raids on London, including the claim that in one raid, 750 aircraft attacked London with more than 1,000 tons of high-explosive incendiaries. That was a false and deliberate effort to convince the German people that the Luftwaffe is hitting back harder than the RAF and American air forces are striking at Germany. And last night's raids over here are now being played up in the same manner to the German public, with lavish accounts of how tons of bombs were dropped on London and how London burns today. Another view here on this matter is that the Germans may be faking their accounts of raids on this country to test British reaction to new devices and weapons the Germans may be using. Be this as it may, we should be getting more and more evidence here that there is still a lot of fight left in the Germans. They may spring some unpleasant surprises during this war before it's over. 
We can, writes one London paper today, expect more raids and probably in a larger scale. There is much that can be done to tighten up and still further improve defenses here. And no effort must be spared to render London as impregnable as humanly possible. But there's another side to this. It should be borne in mind that the Germans are by no means going to have a free hand in whatever hopes and plans they have of prolonging this war. What is developing very rapidly now, as one sees the matter here in London, is a situation in which the German high command is going to be forced to make new and difficult decisions. Decisions such as they never contemplated. Decisions which will complicate their defensive strategy. Up until now, the Germans have had what's known as defensive initiative. They've been able to use their reserves of men and planes and equipment with a certain amount of exactness. They've been able to take their time about making most of their decisions, and they've had time to move their forces here and there around the European fortress. But the pressure of circumstance, both military and political, is now closing in against this German defensive strategy, with Finland and Norway a good example. There's every likelihood the German high command may soon be forced to make a rush withdrawal of their troops in North Finland and North Norway. In fact, there are reports that the withdrawal from North Finland is already underway. And once these withdrawals start, the German high command will be involved in an endless chain of decisions. Their problem of balancing their reserves against the weakest points in their defense lines will become more and more difficult. It's a game that the German high command will play as long as it can. But every month that passes now, the game will become more difficult. And the great and deciding factor in the end is going to be the Allied air offensive against Germany in the months to come. Here in Britain, we may get a better idea of things to come when Prime Minister Churchill makes his war survey at the next sitting of the House of Commons. It's five months now since Churchill made his last full-dress speech on the war. He was buoyant and confident at that time. There's no reason to believe he won't be buoyant and confident again, although we can expect some new warnings against unjustified optimism. Among other things, it's to be hoped that Churchill will shed some light on the great and puzzling questions of the Europe of the future. He will undoubtedly be questioned about Russian-Polish relationships, which show signs of improvement. For more and more here in Britain, one goes conscious now of the problems of peace. Not only the question of new frontiers and the immediate requirements of restoring order, but the question of what the people of Europe are going to be like after four years and more of German occupation. The British Weekly, The Economist, takes up this matter in an article called Outlaw Europe, pointing out that the coming invasion of Western Europe is more than a military matter. It's also something that will add to the great social and political upheaval in Europe. The Economist doesn't paint a very pretty picture of what we may find in Europe when the fighting is over. What it asks have these years of war, the looting, the bombing, the scorched earth policies, the black market, the outlaw bands of underground patriots. What have all these things done to the normal life and the normal values of ordinarily law-abiding people? What about the deep and lasting hatred that have been given to some people? What about the confusion of ideas as to what people want? What about the radical ideas that have developed? It's something that makes you conscious, after all, of the difference between planning the post-war future here in Britain and America and planning that same future for European countries. Here, plans are going ahead for all sorts of reforms, in state medical services, new educational facilities, and the like. And there's great interest here in the newly announced plans for the switchover of America from war to peace. Here, the post-war problems will not be too difficult, after all. But in Europe, as The Economist points out, the problems may be tragic in many ways, largely because the people of Europe, in their desperate struggle for bare survival, have had so little time and energy for political thought or thinking ahead. This is Elmer Peterson in London, saying goodbye on this program until this time next week. You have been listening to War Telescope, a weekly report on the war as seen from London by Elmer Peterson. This is the National Broadcasting Company.